Well, if you'll open your Bibles to that 2 Chronicles 7, 14 passage this morning, we're going to look at that uh, passage as we uh, share the message with you today. Uh, the next couple of Sundays or so, we're going to sort of take just a little break uh, in our uh, Great Questions uh, series. We'll come back to it uh, after Mother's Day. And, uh, but I wanted to uh, share just a message, really it's kind of been on my heart for several weeks, or this verse of Scripture has. And I understand that this is a, a well-worn verse of Scripture, all right? Now, you know, some of them are that way in the Bible, aren't they? I mean, in your Bible, don't you have some that are more worn than others, more little spots there? And uh, this is one of those verses in the Bible that's a, it's a well-worn verse. In other words, you've heard it a lot. You've heard sermons by preachers preached on it all your life. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to let the fact that you know this verse, maybe could even memorize this verse, or that you've heard a whole lot of messages on this verse keep you from missing what God wants to say to you today. Because, you know, sometimes we can do that, can't we? Oh, well, I've read that, so I know everything is nobody. I, 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 I've never gotten to the point that I would say that about a verse. I, I know everything there is nobody. Because you know what I found? God has a way of just showing me something new and different every time I come back to a passage. This week is the National Day of Prayer week. And, and so God has just really had this verse on my heart for several weeks. And, uh, you know, in, in fact, when I was praying about the message weeks ago, thinking about this verse, praying about it again this week. You know, I just said, Lord, is this, is this the passage you really want? And Because and, uh, it, it's been used so much. And I preached on it several times through the years. And and, uh, but the Lord just would not let me go to any other verse of Scripture. So I believe that He wants us to revisit this verse today for a specific reason. It is a favorite verse. It, it's, uh, you know, I have, and if I hang around with you long enough, you'll hear and you'll, you'll maybe start to do it. But I have in my Bible what I call block verses. And, and if I say that's a block verse, in my Bible it's got a block around it. It's got a blue block or a red block or maybe an orange block, or a green block, but it's got a block around it. And that means that is a significant verse to me. And this is one of those block verses in the Bible that has some great principles attached to it. I want us to bow together for prayer, and I want us to pray, and then I want to come back and look at this verse of Scripture and challenge us about it's time to pray for America. Father, I just thank you again for today. And Lord, I, I, I've, I've prayed... I've researched and I've sought your heart this week the best I know how. And it's time for the message to be proclaimed to the people. And Lord, I just pray for the power, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God as I preach this message. Father, I pray that you'd keep our minds open. I pray that you'd keep our hearts soft and attentive to what you want to say to each one of us in this room today. Because Lord, I do believe that there is a message that you have for every one of us in this room, a message that you have for the church today, not only just Olive Branch, but for the church as a whole, across our nation, you have a message for us. And God, I just pray, we'll see that message, we'll hear that message, we'll accept that message, and we'll apply that message and live it out every day of our lives. And I pray this, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes I start a message just diving off into the passage, and sometimes I use a story, and sometimes it's uh, serious, and sometimes it's not. And I don't know how you feel about that, but, you know, I like to have a little fun as I go along in church. I don't think church has to be just serious, serious, serious. And, uh, but uh, I, I love this story. You may have heard it before about old Fred. Fred had uh, gotten sick. He was in the hospital and, and it's not a true story, but it illustrates a point. So i just let you know that as I begin. But he, Fred was sick. He was in the hospital, and, and, and things were just not going well, didn't look good. And, and so they called the pastor. And most time when they call the pastor, that's just not a good sign in some cases, you know. And they called the pastor in, and he got there. And sure enough, when he got there to the hospital, Fred was in, in, in pretty bad shape. Uh, there were tubes everywhere, you know, just, just coming out of Fred everywhere. There were tubes everywhere. And, and uh, the family was all there, and they were all gathered around uh, Fred's bed. And, and the pastor came in, and, and, and when he came in, and Fred's just, you know, it's, that's about his last breath. I mean, it's the end for Fred. 
And uh, when the pastor came in, he just sort of excitedly started to wave his arms and, 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 uh, and the pastor knew, you know, he wanted to try to say something and so he w- walked over there to the, to the bed where Fred was and he was just, just, just flailing his arms with what little strength he had left and motioning for something and, 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 and the pastor finally figured out that he, he wanted a piece of paper and a pen. He wanted to write something and so he, he got him that piece of paper and he got him the pen and Fred wrote something and as he was putting the period to what he was writing, he died. Well, it, you, you can imagine the scene. The pastor took the note from Fred's hand and just sort of folded it. And the family was just distraught. And he just tucked it in the uh, pocket of his suit coat. And, and, uh, and, and they had prayer. And, and, and he forgot about that note. And he, and he went on uh, about his way. And, and then the next day, the, they called him and asked him if he'd do the funeral for Fred. And he agreed to it. And while he was preaching Fred's funeral, he remembered that note. And he remembered that he was wearing the same suit for the funeral that he was wearing when he went to visit old Fred. And so as he was coming to the end of his message at the funeral, he thought, well, you know, maybe maybe Fred had a last word for the family. And so he, he reached into his pocket, pulled out that note, and he shared with the family. He said, you know, when Fred was, was dying... He, he left a note, and I haven't read the note. I don't know what he said on the note. Nobody has read the note, and perhaps Fred left us an encouraging word, and he opened the note, and here's what Fred said. Pastor, somebody's on my oxygen tube. Please get them off. <laughs> and, you know, I know that's not a maybe appropriate story to start with, but, but here's the point. When I look at America, when I look at this nation, It's like something or somebody is standing on the oxygen tube of our country. And and, and if there's ever a time that we do need to pray for America and that we do need to pray in America, I believe it's come to that time. In fact, our nation was founded on Christian principles. And, and, and I believe one of the reasons that God has blessed America is because it was founded on those Christian principles. This country that started in 1776, our forefathers uh, came here looking for a place where they could worship, where, where there would not be one church and one religion. That's what they had in England, and that's what they left. And they came to America seeking something that was different. And, and, and that's, that's the founding of this nation. But, but we've drifted in America. We've even drifted in the church in America. We've drifted. You know, there was a time, and, 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 and understand, I, I, I'm pretty plain spoken at times, and, and I mean to offend no one, but, but there was a time in America when teenage pregnancy was seen as a scandal. It was. There, there was a time in America when marriage was sacred. There was a time in America when homosexuality, it isn't called that anymore, it's just now same-sex marriage. But it's still homosexuality. And and, and there was a time in America when when that was not acceptable and when it was seen as sin against the principles of God. There, There was a time in America when child abuse was little heard of. There was a time in America when Drugs were something you went to the drugstore and purchased when you were sick. And there was a time in America when alcoholism was considered a sin. But now it's a disease. The only one you can get by drinking in a bottle, though. Every other sickness I get, I don't drink it and get it. I catch it. You see what I'm saying? But I'm just saying, we have drifted, is my point. We have, we have drifted in America. Not only have we drifted as a nation, we've we've drifted as congregations. You know, there was a time in America when politicians went to Washington for the good of the country. They really did. They went to Washington for the good of the country. They went to Washington to serve the needs of the people, not their own personal agendas. There was a time in America when politicians would go to Washington and they would stay for a while, and they would return to their own homes, to their own careers, and their own businesses, and their own farms. It wasn't a lifetime job. But all of that's changed. We have drifted in America. 
John Adams, the second president, vice president to our first president, George Washington, said that the founding principles, and listen, this, this wasn't a preacher or a teacher or a deacon. John Adams said, this nation was founded upon the founding principles of Christianity. And, and, and while I wish not to be unkind and an intolerant person, I just have to simply say to you today that America was founded on Christian principles. Not Hindu principles, not Buddhist principles, not even Muslim principles. It was founded on Christian principles. And, and that's why I think where we are as a nation is so important. And you might be saying, well, you know, this sounds like more of a depressing message than an encouraging message. But look, I, I'm not a pessimist. I am really a glowing optimist. But I want to tell you today that the survival of our nation, and I really do fear for America. Here's why I fear. I fear for our country because I'm afraid we have insulted God. I am afraid we have insulted God. And I'm afraid that we're living in a nation that just continues to insult God. To just like you know, turn ourselves away from the principles of God's Word. And, and, and so I fear for America in, in, in that way. But the secret to America's healing is not going to come from the White House. It's not going to come from the State House, meaning Munga. It, it, it's not even going to come from the School House. If America's healed and our nation survives, it's going to happen in the Church House. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. That's what I want to talk to us about today. Because so many times people say, oh, well, you know, if Hollywood would jest, or if the government would jest, or if the abortionists would jest. But listen, they're not going to change. God doesn't even look to them for change. God looks to His people for change. God looks to me. God looks to us. And this passage addresses that whole situation, and I want to talk to you about it. Now, I understand that this verse references the nation of Israel, and I understand that we're talking about Solomon. And, and, and really, the context here is that the temple was built, and Solomon had finished it, and he dedicates that, that wonderful temple. And, and in chapter 6, Solomon has this long prayer that he prays. In the first part of chapter 6, he calls the people together and he just reminds them how God has blessed them and how God has led them to where they are and how they have what they have because of God. And you know what, that, that, that wouldn't be bad that we always remind ourselves ever so long that, that we are where we are because of the hand of God. Because every now and then we get to thinking that, well, we are where we are because of us. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes even in the church we get that thinking that. We, we are where we are, we've accomplished what we have, we've done what we've done because of us. Look, if it hadn't been for God, in fact, here's, way, here's the way God puts it. Here's the way Jesus put it in John 15. Without me, you can do something. No, you can do nothing. You can't accomplish anything. Uh, I can't preach a sermon without His help, without His guidance. I, I can't save anybody. Only the Holy Spirit can do that job. So we have to, do, we have to come to God. We, we have to turn to Him. And, and, and that's America's only hope. And that's what this passage is all about. Solomon just reminds them of God's blessings. And then he begins this long prayer, praying to God. And in chapter 7, God answers Solomon's prayer. And, and, and he, he goes over some things with Solomon. He lets Solomon know that he's going to bless him, that he's going to use him. And, and, and he cautions him about some things. He cautions him about sin. In fact, Solomon prayed about the heavens being shut up and he prayed about the locusts coming and eating everything up and, and he prayed about pestilence and, and, and diseases and all those kinds of things. Solomon prayed about all that in chapter 6. And do you know why Solomon said to the people those things come? Because of one thing, sin. You know why God doesn't bless us in America? One thing, sin. You know why God doesn't bless us in our churches sometimes? One thing sin and the thing is until we get that right you know it's okay to pray for God to bless America to sing God bless America and all that but listen I'm going to tell you something God isn't going to ever bless America until America gets right with God 
It's only then that God will bless America. And here in this passage, God focuses on me and He focuses on us as His people. And He gives us a reason why we need to pray for America. And I want to share with you three reasons why you and I need to pray for America. And I hope you understand. I don't, I don't mean just pray. I mean, folks, we really need to get down to business when it comes to praying for America. We really do. If we really believe in America, if we really love America, if we really care about America, then we need to pray for America. Three reasons why. I want to walk you through this passage this morning, and I want to show you three reasons why you and I, why God isn't looking at somebody else. He's looking to you and He's looking to me. Three reasons. Here, here's reason number one. Reason number one that we need to pray for America is because of our connection to the Lord. Because of our connection to the Lord. Now I want you to look at that verse. I want you to circle a couple of phrases in this verse. In verse 14, here's, here's what I want you to circle. He says, if, what's the next phrase? My people who are called by, I want you to circle that next phrase, my name. If my people who are called by my name. There is the connection that God is interested in. And you see, if you go back to verse, uh, look up at verse number 12. In verse number 12, this is where God spoke to, to Solomon after his prayer. And in verse number 12 it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said, Here's what he said to him. I've heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now I'm going to come to verse 13 in just a minute, but let's just pause right there. Solomon had prayed and God said, okay, I, I've chosen a place. I've chosen a place where I'm going to dwell. And, and here's the point. God has chosen a place whereby He begins a movement that goes outward. Don't miss this. He's chosen a place. He's chosen a people whereby He starts to move and that movement goes outward. And let me tell you where it is. You, you know where God has chosen to begin a movement that would trickle outward? It's us. It's His people. It's His, it's His church house. Why? Because He has a connection with us. You know, the lost person out there, sometimes we, uh, we, we say, oh, well, boy, there's lost people. They're just sinning so bad, and they're just doing this and doing that. Well, you know, that's all a lost person knows. You ever thought about that? That's all they know is sin. But what bugs me is that the church doesn't live any better than it does. That's what bugs me, is that God's people don't live any better than they do. Because look, we, we have a connection to God. And that's what he's trying to tell us in this passage of Scripture. It, it, it begins, praying for America begins with you and me, and the reason is because our connection to God. And I want you to learn two things about our spiritual connection to God this morning. Two things I want you to learn. Here, here's the first thing. I want you to learn, number one, that it, that it is an intimate connection. It is an intimate connection. Notice what he says in, in those two phrases I, I focused on. He says, if what? My people. And then a little bit later he said, call by my name. Do you see the intimacy there? The, the intimacy is, is that, you know, this connection that you and I have with God, it's different from the connection of a master to a servant. It is the connection of a father and a son. In fact, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, in verse 18 it says, For you and I were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, and then he drops down to verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or spot. So you and I have this, we have this, we have this intimate connection with God. But the second thing I want you to learn about our connection is not only that it's an intimate connection, I want you to also notice that it is an identifying connection. Notice he said, my people, but secondly he said, who are called by what? My name. Now here's the point. You and I, every one of us in here today, that claims to be a Christian, says you're saved, you know Christ, your personal Savior, every one of us, now look, not the preacher, not the deacons, every one of us, every one of us has a responsibility before God to live every day a life that honors God. Where? 
out there in that world. That's what makes the difference. Here's where comes sort of the, the crux of the matter. Here's where the, sometimes the, 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 the hair on the cat gets rubbed the wrong way. And, you know, sometimes preachers get accused for doing that. Billy Sunday was a hard old preacher. And, man, they said, you know, some, somebody said to him one day when, he, when they went out, said, you know, Mr. Sunday said, you really did rub the hair on the cat the wrong way. He said, the cat turned around, I'll rub it the right way. And, you know, sometimes, hey, we, we want the preacher to change his message. No, God wants the people to change their way. And see, we have a responsibility to identify. Here's the way my daddy always said it. When I was growing up, and I'd, be, I'd get ready to go out on a Friday night. He always said it. He never failed to say it. Boy. Now, you might get in trouble saying that today, but that's the way he's, he'd say, boy, you better remember. Can y'all finish the phrase? Who you are. You better not forget who you are. You better remember your name. That's what he was saying. And you better remember who you are. Well, I think God is telling us here as the church, not just today, not just this morning at 9 o'clock sitting in this church, but this afternoon, after lunch, and tomorrow, and wherever you are, we have an obligation and a responsibility to uphold the name of God. Here, here's the way John put it. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, great little verse to remember, he says, He who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. And, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, here's, here's the way the passage puts it. The end of that verse says, He has left us an example that we should walk in his steps. So you see, it's, it's, it's an identifying relationship that we have with God. I love this story. Listen to it closely. This lady had gotten involved in politics. And I don't think it's wrong to be involved in politics. Maybe that's a problem today. We don't have enough good, godly people with backbone who are in politic, top politics that will hold to the standard. But So this lady was in politics, and she was so excited. Things were going well. And she came home one evening uh, after, you know, several days on the road, just from place to place to place. And she said to her husband, she said, I'll tell you what, it, it, it just absolutely looks like we're going to sweep the state. He said, I think you need to start with the back door. And you know what? That's what I believe God is saying to us in this passage of Scripture. We need to start in the church with right where we are. Now, this message not, might not be as encouraged to you. Some of them are, but I'm telling you, it's needful in America. If we're going to change America, we're going to pray for America, it begins by recognizing our connection to the Lord. Now, here's the second thing in this verse. I want you to not only notice our, our connection to the Lord, but number two, I want you to notice our challenge from the Lord because he gives us a challenge. He challenges us in, in three ways. And, and I want you to look at the rest. Let me just read the rest of this passage and then I'll, I'll share this threefold challenge. But, but in, in verse 14, the latter part, he says, if my people will call by my name, and then here comes the challenge. That, that first part is the connection. Here's the challenge. Will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's the challenge. Now let me tell you what it is. It's, it's a, it's a three-fold challenge. Or, or I could put it to you this way. It's a challenge to do three things. And here they are. Number one, it's a challenge to be dependent. To be dependent. You notice what he said? He said, we'll, we'll humble themselves and pray. Do, do you know what humility is? All humility is, folks, humility is an acknowledging that you are dependent on someone or something. That's what humility is. And that's what God says, my first challenge to the church, my first challenge to my people is to recognize that they are dependent upon me. See, whenever, whenever I say, you know, I'm dependent upon God, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, number one, I don't have any faith in my abilities. And number two, I have all the faith in the world in God's abilities. That, that's what humility is. You know what pride is? Pride says, I don't really need God. Do you know where we are in America as a whole? We're prideful. We're, we're to a point in America where we, we just don't believe we need God. I'm telling you, that's exactly where we are. We think that a financial situation will fix our nation. 
Or we think that a political person will fix our nation. Or we think better this or better that will fix our nation. Listen, I'm telling you. Adam and Eve had it as good as they could get it. And they failed because of sin. Better this or that won't change anything. You know what? It, it goes to the heart. It goes to the heart. And, and it starts with recognizing that we're dependent upon Almighty God. That, that we can't, as I've already mentioned, make it unless God helps us, unless, uh, unless we uh, depend on Him for everything. And sometimes in the church, we depend on human programs more than we do divine power. But of course, I want to tell you, it is only divine power that will change the heart of a person that changes the nature and makeup of the church. So the first challenge is to be, to be dependent. The, the second challenge is to be devoted. Notice what he says. He says, well, humble themselves and pray. And then he says, do what? Seek my face. Seek my face. See, that's the challenge to be devoted to God. That's the challenge to be focused on God. And I just ask you today, how focused is your life on God today? Or are there other things that catch your focus more than him or are there things that distract you or are you really focused on God you know God gave me a phrase this week I wrote it down in my prayer journal I wrote I wrote this phrase down I, I, I don't want to forget it I want to be able to go back and, and see it but but here, here's when I was just thinking about this passage here's the phrase that that God put on my heart and I'm afraid this is true across America America, here's what I wrote, America isn't interested in seeking God's face. It only wants to seek God's hand. And here's what I mean by that. We don't really want to seek God's face. We just want his hand. Here's, here, here's what I mean. We just want God's blessing. But we don't want to do any of the repenting that we might have to do in order to get God's blessing. We just want God's blessing. That, that's what I'm afraid we want as a nation. We just want, God bless us again. And I'm for God blessing us again. In fact, I pray that God will bless America again. I pray there will be a turning in America because I believe there has to be a turn before there can be the blessings of God again on our nation. And so there's a, there's a challenge to be devoted to God, to seeking God's face. And that word just simply means, you know, when you seek something, you're really searching for it. You remember the story in, in Luke 15 of the woman who lost her coin and the Bible says she was searching for it? Now look, she wasn't just sitting having a cup of coffee looking, hoping she could see it under something. She was actively searching for that coin. She was sweeping. She was spring cleaning was being done in the fall. It, I, I don't know if that's how that's, but you understand my point I'm trying to make. She actively was searching for that because she, she, had, she wanted to find it. It was of value to her. And the same thing is true in our lives when we start seeking for God. So, so the, there's the challenge to be dependent. There's the challenge to be devoted. And, and number three, there is the challenge to be different. That's a word you hadn't heard in a long time in the church, is it? To be different. Uh, we used to call it sanctification. Well, the Bible still calls it sanctification. It's still the same thing. It hasn't changed. To be different. Here, you, you see what he says? Well, humble themselves and pray, and then what? Seek his face, and what? Turn from their wicked you say, well, do we have wicked ways in the church? Well, you, you, you think about it. You think about it. But you know, i tell you what. Something's wrong in the church when people can teach in Sunday school classes and live any way they want to outside the walls of this church. That's not right. And we hold a really high standard. We don't have Sunday school here, but we hold a really high standard in Greenville. I promise you we do. Something's wrong when men can be deacons in our churches in America and they can... They, they can be down at the pub this and the pub that. Man, we got bylaws in Greenville. You can't be a deacon in that and, 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 and be that. I'm just telling I'm not picking on deacons, but I'm just telling you. Look, we got preachers that got doctrines that come right out of hell and morals like alley cats in pulpits across this nation. And I'm telling you, it's, and then we want, we want to say, well, God bless America, not until the church gets right. Will God be able to bless America? When we are ordaining people that have no, no biblical principles or standards to be ordained and our churches are doing that, how can we expect God to bless this nation 
You, you see, we've got to turn from that. We, we've got to be different. God expects us to be different. I'm just telling you, tomorrow God expects you. He expects me. You find me anywhere tomorrow, God expects you to be able to find me being different because I've got this connection. So there's the challenge. That's the reason God's calling the church to pray for America because of our connection to Him, because of our challenge from Him. And number three, and this is the good part. You want to get to the good part, right? Well, this is the good part. Because of our confidence in the Lord. See, here's the confidence. This is why I'm, I'm an optimist. I, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in Washington these days because they just don't seem to operate on common sense principles. You ever notice that? They just don't. But I do have confidence in God. And I do have confidence that, it, that, that, that if I will, not even you, but if I will, just draw a circle around myself and say, God, okay, I've got this connection with you and I'm going to accept your challenge. I believe what that book says, that if I will do that, that guess what? Here's what God says he will do. I can have confidence that God will do two things for me. And he'll do the same two things for you. Here they are. Number one, he'll help us. He'll help us. In fact, isn't that what he says? He says, I will, I, will, I will hear. I will hear from heaven. God will help us. He'll hear from heaven. And it's almost like if you want God to hear, you better walk through the first part of this verse. You know, you better walk through the first part of this verse. Because what is it that keeps God from hearing us? What is it that keeps the lines of communication from being open? It's sin. Now, you know, I don't watch much television anymore. It isn't much on it worth watching. I wish they'd just let me get the Gunsmoke channel and the ESPN channel, and I'd be good. If I could just have those two, I'd be good. I really would. I want my football in the fall. I don't really care much about it, but I, I do like old Gunsmoke. I do. And I saw an episode the other day where this gang came in, and they just, they just took over the whole town. And, you know, the first thing they did before they ever got to town you can figure it out. It's been in old western forever and ever. They got to cut what first? They got to cut the, they got to cut the telegraph line. Why? Because they don't want them to be able to send for help out. You know the devil is the smartest person. Because the first thing he tries to do in our lives every single day now, and I'm telling you, he doesn't he doesn't come every once in a while. It's every day. He's pounding every day in our lives to do one thing: cut off the line of communication. So that if we find ourselves in a tough spot, that line's cut. And you know what cuts that line? Sin cuts that line of communication. Sin cuts us off from God. But if we'll come to God and we'll repent and confess as God instructs us, He'll help us. Number two, He'll honor us. He'll not only help us, but He will honor us. Honor us by doing what? I, I, I like the two things. One, He'll forgive. Aren't you glad? He'll forgive. He'll forgive our sins. And after forgiving, you know what comes? Healing. God has steps. After forgiving comes healing. And, and here's, here's the point I want to wrap up with. It's this. I said to you earlier, God has a place and God has a people that he always starts his movement with. And, and, and I, I, I never thought about this and preached on this passage many times, but I never thought about this until this week. God has a place or he has a people that he starts his movement. And it's always his people. It's always my people who are called by my name. That's his place. That's his people. That's where he wants to start his work. That's where he wants to begin his movement. Because, see, here's what happens. God start right here at Olive Branch Baptist Church, a movement in the hearts of all of us, his people. And you know what happens? That movement doesn't stay here, does it? It won't stay just in this room. In fact, that's already kind of begun. Can we not say that? That's already kind of begun, and it hasn't stayed in here. It's what? It gets experienced outside these walls. People hear about it, you talk about it, and other people come. Because what's happened? God started a movement. Do you see, do you see his plan? There it is right there. That's why God always starts with, that's why he doesn't worry about Hollywood or God. He starts with his people and he starts doing something in the lives of his people and that starts spreading out and it'll just spread on out. And that's how God has chosen to do it.
And you know what happens when we do what God asks us to do? You go back to the first verse of this chapter when Solomon had, had, had challenged the people when he had prayed that great prayer. You know, you know what verse 1, 2 of chapter 7 says? It says, says the glory of God came down on that place. So, so strong was the glory of God that the priests couldn't even see to enter. Now, wouldn't you love to see God so strong in America that sinners couldn't see to see him? Wouldn't you love to see that? You see what I'm saying? Now, that, that's my phrase right there, but I'm just saying, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to see that? Hey, I've heard stories, the old-time stories, when Billy Sunday and those guys were preaching and Charles Finney, those great revivalists, and even stories of Billy Graham. When they would be in certain towns across America, the power of God would descend in such a powerful way that sinners would come to the houses of saints and run to the churches. And you know what? They, they'd just be begging for somebody how to tell them how to get right with God. Wouldn't you love to see that in America? Wouldn't you love to see? But you know, it starts. Don't think, oh, well, we're just down here at Owasa. That's where we are. Nothing ever happens in Owasa. We're just down here at Owasa. Listen, don't, don't look at it like that. We're God's people, folks. And nothing is small with God. Nothing. If we'll do what God asks, God will start a little movement right here. But that movement will be felt out yonder. And it will be felt out there and out there. What would happen? What could happen in America if every preacher that stands in the pulpit stood up with the power of the Spirit of God, with the boldness of the Word of God, and proclaimed the message to the people of God? And God's people, just in the churches of America, got right. What would happen to this nation? I'll tell you. The glory of God come down. And we'd see a different America. And we'd see a better America. And that can happen, but it starts with us, God's people. I want to ask you to bow with me in prayer. Heads bowed. As we prepare for our time of invitation and decision, I just want to ask you today. I just want to, I want to challenge you in this way. And it's not my challenge, really. It's God's challenge. I want to challenge you to be dependent. In other words, to trust God for everything. To just rely upon Him. To realize that without God in your life, you really can't do anything. I want to challenge you today to be devoted to seek His face. In other words, not just want the blessings of God, but want the relationship with the blesser. And I want to challenge you, as I challenge myself, to be different. To be a different person tomorrow than even today. Let the glory of God, let the presence of God, let the power of God show forth in our lives so that a, a movement that's already begun could just continue and grow larger, not to the glory of this church, but to the glory of God. So I want to challenge you with the same challenges that God challenged us all. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its power. And I thank you for its pointedness. God, help each of us to accept your challenge as you speak to us, your people, that we might experience your help and that we might experience you honor us through forgiveness and healing. And the movement began with us and spread out through this neighborhood, spread out through this community, even through this county, that the glory of God would be experienced and felt in our area. We pray this in Jesus' name.